as anyone who plays RPGs knows, this has actually been a pretty good year for them. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Rank is the 10 best RPGs of 2021. Starting off at number 10, it's Near Replicant version 1.224744871392. I said that for the fun of it, but that is actually the official title of the game. So the original was from a, a long time ago. We only saw Near Gestalt back in 2010, and it was just called Near here. But the original Near Replicant got a number of upgrades to more closely resemble Near Automata. And as a fan of the original Near Gestalt, having this restored basically to the original Japanese version and enhanced really, I just think, makes this game make a little bit more sense with Near Automata. Firstly, because the main character looks like they belong in that world. Secondly, in that the combat much more closely resembles Near Automata. And although, like, this game is very different in terms of the types of enemies and AI, I would call Automata vastly superior in that department. This game really just benefits from feeling that pace. When the original was kind of clunkier and slower, it's still, I mean, not the exact same thing as Near Automata. It just feels like a lot closer. Like these feel like two games in the same series, at least more so than the original Near that we got here in North America did. And there's also more content that they've added into the two acts. There's another ending. All in all, it's just a more complete package that connects, I feel, much better. And the enhancements are super appreciated. And number nine is Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, we put Nier at 10 because it's 10 years old. We put this one at nine because while it's not a full-blown RPG, it, it has some RPG elements. You have a basic skill tree, for instance, but there is a lot of Mass Effect influence here. You got a big emphasis on dialogue, choosing options, managing teammate relationship type stuff. And it's overall just a game that they, I mean, I wasn't sure what to think when they announced it. You and I both know that Marvel's Avengers, made by the same people, published by the same people, was a games as a service kind of disaster. And they were like, oh, well, we get that that was a disaster. Here's the opposite. And for for me, when I hear that, I'm always like, yeah, you get it, sure, show me the proof. And they kind of did. Guardians of the Galaxy is a good game. You find a lot of different influences, like at some parts it feels like Telltale, some parts you're gonna really feel like it's Mass Effect or Uncharted, and it's really got this unique team leader combat system where you're kind of like if Nathan Drake was dropped into Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's a game that really works, and it's something unique, and it's not perfect, but I really enjoyed it. At number eight is Darkest Dungeon 2, which is a game that revamps the original formula pretty significantly. For one, your runs are way shorter in this game. These aren't 100 hour runs, these are, but this is for a reason. Between the smaller amount of time you spend with them and the overall smaller team of four characters, you're learning much more about these characters. They're fleshed out, and I think that this is a positive trade off. This is also a game that is still in early access and things will probably still be changing until they finalize that. That said, the different structure of playing a roguelike and a stagecoach, traveling across different biomes, and still making the same kind of very difficult choices, still trying to keep a torch alight, still managing stress, which by the way now affects relationships within your team. I have seen some give this a little bit of crap for departing too far from the original game, and I'm gonna say I kind of disagree. I don't think there's a reason to have a Darkest Dungeon 2 unless you're going to try some different stuff. And the experience is different enough to justify it, but it's not so different like I've heard some people say. I also think as it's developed through early access, it's gotten better and better. I just enjoy it. I think it's a good game. I'm not sure if I would rate it as as good as the first, but I think it's a worthwhile addition to the series. And number seven is Eastward, which is really a strange combination of a lot of things. The most prominent of which is obviously Legend of Zelda. You can see influences from nearly every 90s role-playing and action role-playing experience, along with some heavy Studio Ghibli stuff, especially in the art in some of the progression of the narrative itself. Like, they use a very quirky storytelling device 
in that the game is called Eastward and you're literally just on a linear train ride eastward. You start off in a mining town post kind of apocalypse where there's a disease that has sent a lot of people underground. You fear the outside world, but you also kind of really want to see it. This is not a briskly paced game, but it's an artfully created one that really does what it sets out to do. I would call it warm in tone. And when I brought up Studio Ghibli, I think that's probably the most salient thing to compare it to, despite it being the only thing I brought up that's not a game. If you like a Studio Ghibli movie that kind of bounces around from genre to genre, that's what this is. And it does it really well. It brings a good challenge in its Zelda-like gameplay. If it's maybe a little more linear than you might expect a Zelda game to be, I love Eastward. It's a fantastic game. And number six is Bravely Default 2. Now, while I certainly did enjoy Bravely Second, there was one thing it did that I didn't particularly love. While it didn't hamper my enjoyment of the game, there was a mild bit of disappointment when it continued the narrative from the first, instead of making Bravely Default the real successor to Final Fantasy that it kind of promised to be and giving us a totally new game. That's what Bravely Default 2 is. Bravely Second is a direct sequel. Bravely Default is a Final Fantasy-like sequel. Now, there's arguments and fan theories over whether the Final Fantasies are all connected or not. If I'm honest, I just like a game that gives us a big, epic story in a new world, and Bravely Default 2 completely delivers on that. If you like traditional JRPGs, this is where to go. It's fantastic. And number five is Shin Megami Tensei 5. Now, if you're familiar with this series, it is the sort of sister series to Persona. And this is the game where they decided they were going to do everything they could to try to modernize and talk about more recent issues. It's a really interesting title. It retains all the stuff that you enjoy about this series while also doing a lot of experimenting and frankly interesting plot developments and incorporation of some more modern game elements like a fast travel system that makes the game just significantly better to deal with in terms of the mundane elements that exist in every JRPG. Really, this is a game that knows what it's trying to do and kind of shows us that the developers at Atlas really know how to do it better than anybody else. And number four is Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Now, I know with Nier, that's an old game, and we talked about it first, despite it not being a new game. Neither is Mass Effect Legendary Edition. It's the trilogy remade, and with a lot of quality of life type improvements, technical stuff, visual enhancements, remastering. Obviously, the original Mass Effect being the oldest of them is the one that benefited the most, but really all across the board, it's a very good version of these games, and I'd highly recommend it. It's also definitely worth the price of admission to have all three games on tap at any time. Rumor has it it may come to the Xbox Game Pass, so keep your eyes open for that too. And number three is Scarlet Nexus, which kind of works as an anime cyberpunk Devil May Cry slash platinum game style romp. And uh, obviously that doesn't fully describe it, but if you're on board for that description, the game's not going to disappoint. In terms of stuff it does beyond that, uh, there's a lot of psychic power stuff, a lot of what you might qualify as magic in another game. Uh, this game, it's got a really interesting story, but a lot of it depends on execution and kind of where it goes. Because like, if you do the base explanation, it sounds kind of obvious. Like there's people with superpowers and then there's evil mutants that they fight there's a lot more to it than that trust me but also understand it's one where they dump a lot of exposition in the beginning and as it goes it gets a lot better if basically all of this makes sense to you and it does for me like this is the type of game i enjoy and you're looking for something to play after having gotten through the near games and want something along those lines but maybe not quite the same thing this is where to go scarlet nexus is great for that and number two, it's Monster Hunter Rise, the Nintendo Switch iteration of Monster Hunter, which built very much on a lot of the stuff that we saw in Monster Hunter World. They moved the game to the Resident Evil engine, and for a Switch game, it's pretty visually impressive, but what really shines is the gameplay. They've added a vertical element with a grappling hook, and obviously the name indicates this, Rise. They want you going upward, and upward you will go. If you can imagine Monster Hunter World with a few elements 
elements, maybe a little bit simplified, adding in that verticality, this is that. And it does it in a way that will just instantaneously take hours and hours and hours from you. You'll be like, what happened? Oh, I turned on Monster Hunter Rise. It's great. If you like Monster Hunter, particularly if you like Monster Hunter World and want to be able to play something on Switch that in some ways improves the formula for the format, or rather for the platform, this is it. They, they do exactly that. And finally, at number one, it's Tales of Arise, the latest in the long-running Tales series. It is really what I would call a great entry to the Tales series. The story itself is interesting because it sort of pits two different worlds against each other in an interesting way. Not necessarily straightforwardly, but there is a technologically advanced world and a medieval world. And the two primary characters come from, you guessed it, either of them. This game features great updates, but not overhauls of the already great Tales battle system. And between that and the story, which does make good usage of its characters, Tales of Arise is really a beautiful and very fun entry to this long-running and fantastic series. A couple of quick bonus games for you. The first is Ender Lilies, Quietus of the Nights. Probably one you haven't heard of, but like it's an incredibly well-done, very polished Metroidvania which incorporates elements of Dark Souls and like a totally different aesthetic from what you expect. You play as a little girl who has the ability to purify undead spirits and those spirits join her and basically function as her ability to attack. It's actually an interesting flourish in terms of both narrative and gameplay that kind of makes you feel vulnerable in a cool way. It's probably one of the best Metroidvanias the last several years. I would really recommend checking it out. Moving on next is Persona 5. Strikers, an action RPG, which continues the plot after Persona 5. In many ways, it's just a full-blown sequel that revamps the type of game you're playing from JRPG to action RPG. Now, what's fun about it is that it's a Dynasty Warriors game. Omega Force made it, and everything that you like about good Dynasty Warriors games is there. Next is The Rift Breaker, a base-building action RPG mech game game with survival elements that ultimately ends up playing a lot like a hack and slash and that's a good thing moving on it's outriders a game that i hardly expected to be an rpg of any sort when it was originally announced but as they released information it became more interesting in terms of gameplay systems and although at its core it's a co-op third person shooter there is so much rpg stuff it's almost completely different from any other in that genre. Next is Biomutant, which let me go ahead and say is probably going to be a better setup for a, an amazing sequel that really realizes all of its ideas, but is a pretty darn good game. I'd maybe wait until it goes on sale because 60 is a little steep for it. If this were a $40 game, I would basically say this is amazing, but it's not. It's a $60 game. There's aspects of it which are a little half-baked, but it it really does deliver in terms of giving you this goofy mutant animal you build based on size and characteristics and endow with different abilities based on that. It's fun. It's kind of a hack and slash, kind of a kung fu game, kind of a platinum games kind of a Dark Souls. Like, it's a lot of things at once that it's kind of throwing in there, and it just isn't there yet. I do feel like this is eventually going to be a series that's very good, and I hope it gets the support to stick around for that. Finally, our last game is Chernobylite, a science fiction survival horror RPG. This one has the distinction of being 3D scanned from the Chernobyl disaster area, which isn't quite stalker, but definitely wants to fill the shoes of Stalker and does in a number of key ways that are very fun. That's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is a course of subscription, so click subscribe. And don't forget to enable notification. As always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter, Falcon Hero. We'll see you next time, right here on Game Ranks.